I, I'm Jack Rosenberg. And I'm Elliot Science. We are the co-presidents of the Student Club Enough at Greeley. Enough stands for Educate Now on Understanding Genocide and Hate. And the mission of our club is to empower students to stand up to hate and to develop a community of acceptance and tolerance through the education and understanding of people's differences. Tonight we are very glad to partner with the town and the library to bring in the authors of The American Way, A True Story of Nazi Escape, Superman, and Marilyn Monroe. I want to introduce, or you can start. Um, we'd like to introduce the authors first, Helen Stupinski, or Helene. Um, she's a nationally best-selling author of three memoirs. She writes regularly for the New York Times, <laughs> New York Times, while also appearing in the Washington Post and the New York Magazine, Travel and Leisure, and dozens of other publications. She's a professor at NYU for journalism and lives in Brooklyn. Bonnie Siegler is the founder and creative director of the award-winning multidisciplinary graphic design studio, Eight and a Half, the author of Dear Client, a guide for people who work with creatives, and Signs of Resistance, a visual history of protest in America. She also taught design in the graduate schools of Yale University and School of Visual Arts for many years. She lives in Connecticut. And we'd also like to give a thanks to Rabbi Brusso, who is here with us from the Bet Torah Synagogue to host the Q&A. We hope you enjoy. Thank you, my friends. Um, so uh, we thank all the co-sponsors, um, and I just want to say, Bonnie and Helene, it's really an amazing thing that we have teens uh, who take these issues very seriously. Uh, and this is not just a one-off. There's been many events over the years where they've taken the lead on these issues. So we're very proud of the next generation, um, and um, we're honored that uh, you know they're they're here to to welcome you. Um, so um, what a great book! I had. <laughs> First of all, fun reading it, also riveting and fascinating. There were things that I learned um, that I didn't know before, so thank you for that. Um, as a comic book collector when I was younger, that was really exciting. I have a collection in um, our storage space of dozens of comics that I haven't looked at in years that I feel like I want to go back and look at now. Um, I'm going to come over and look at them, too. So. <laughs> Yes, but you're welcome to. Um, part of me is like, I don't know what I have there, right? I do not have an Action Comics number one no, no. issue of Superman. But you confess that you collected Marvel and not DC. Mostly. Yeah. <laughs> Mostly. We can't help you. <laughs> Sorry. Yes, I do have some Dark Knight graphic novels. But anyway, um, so I just wanted, for those who haven't um, read this book, um, it's an amazing... Um, number of stories that are woven together. Um, Bonnie's uh, family included people who survived the Holocaust, who she was close with and um, heard stories from, but didn't really know all the stories until later. She found this film that her grandfather had made of Marilyn Monroe from a very famous night when there was a promotion for the movie The Seven Year Itch. Uh, and people gathered um, in Manhattan to see her in her famous dress billowing. Um, and he was the one who took that film and that led you on an odyssey um, to meet Helene to then put this book together. And I just wanna say that um, if you had shown me the different strands of the book, there's no way I would have been able to weave this together. So major could, I don't know if you had like a storyboard or how you did that. No, we do kind of wing it, you know. <laughs> okay, right. I do. But some publishers felt the same way as you. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't believe it. They like, didn't think what we is this mess? Together. Right, exactly. Well, I mean, clearly you had a writer's eye to be able to make all these connections because it flows beautifully and the stories go back and forth between the States and Europe in a very fast paced, almost you know, comic book kind of way um, between the mythical and the real. Um, and so I just wanted to start, um, Bonnie, with you and say, like, ask you the question, y you knew members of your family, you heard stories, what is it you learned through this process and in what ways did it make you think about those people you thought you knew a little differently? 
I, it fills me with regret that I didn't talk to them and ask them to tell me the stories when we were, you know, having celebrations together, because I knew, I thought I knew them, but until we started researching the book, I knew nothing. One of my cousins survived four concentration camps. I had no idea. Another one we we detailed in the book, an incredible escape, like from the movies. I had no idea. So really, I mean. My grandfather's stories I knew because he was a storyteller, so he would get up and, and amuse everyone with his anecdotes, but only the anecdotes and only the fun stuff. So I never got anything from the edges, you know, any of the pain or the horror, really. So it wasn't until researching that I found out how my great grandparents were murdered, what happened to all these members of my family that, to be perfectly honest, I didn't even know existed before this. It was incredible, but really, especially the young people, I just encourage you to talk to your older relatives, get their stories while they're still with us. Did you know that your relatives were connected to some of these famous um, a comic book characters, celebrities, like? No, nothing like that, because we didn't know, my grandfather actually never told the truth about who signed for him to come to America, because if you were in Europe, you needed an American to say, I'll take re financial responsibility for this person, so I'll sign his papers, and if he comes here and doesn't work and needs money, I'll support him. So people, mostly that never happened. I mean, I don't think it ever happened, actually, that somebody went back to a sponsor for money. But um, my grandfather had said somebody else had signed for him, and then it wasn't for until we started working on the book that I found out that the guy who founded DC Comics signed for him. And at the time, they were putting out the very first issue of Superman, the same week that he signed for my grandfather, that guy was sending Superman into the world for the first time in 1938. Um, so I didn't know anything. Once I found out and I started asking relatives, they would be like, oh yeah, the Superman guy, sure I knew. <laughs> Nobody had told me, and I'm old. Right. <laughs> I feel like there was this generation, and I, I grew up with as well, this sort of like, sha still, like, we don't talk about things, right. and then when you ask them, well, of course. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> And, and in fact, <laughs> it's funny you say that, when we found the film, um, I called my grandfather and said, uh, we called him, my grandparents, Omi and Opie, and I said, Opie, Opie, we found the film. And he said, of course you did. <laughs> so Helene, you grew up Italian Catholic. <laughs> right. And uh, right for the New York Times, you teach students at NYU, you encounter students all the time. Could you talk a bit about your trajectory of awareness of the Holocaust as an important historic event and um, how you increased your awareness through this and then also talk a bit about the students you work with yeah. when it comes to that issue. Yeah, um, I mean, I knew, I think, as much as most non-Jews know about the Holocaust. You know, I'd read Anne Frank when I was a kid. Um, I read um, Survival at Auschwitz, I think, in college. You know, the usual trajectory. Um, I thought I knew stuff, but I didn't know anything. Hmm. And so when we took this deep dive, it was um, it was incredible, but it was it was hard. You know, it was really sorrowful. And uh, the great thing about this book is that it has three topics. You know, it's it's got the Holocaust, but it's also got Superman and Marilyn Monroe. So whenever I was in like reaching a deep depression over the Holocaust, I would like change gears and then do some research into Marilyn Monroe. You know, and then get out of that hole but then go back, you know? And, and the um, book kind of does that too. Yeah, the book when does it, it too. When it feels yeah. like it's too dark. It, and I have to say also, because you're hearing this is a Holocaust book, it's very uplifting. It is, it, it's, it has a happy ending. <laughs> but um, yeah, we, you know, we sort of realized maybe halfway through the process that um, it's not a book just for Jewish people, it's a book for people who don't know about the Holocaust. And that's who we really want to target because I think if you do have family that um, survived the Holocaust or died in the Holocaust, you know a lot about it. You know, when I teach, I teach at um, the school of the New York Times in the summer, um, it's high school students who want to be writers. And, um, and this actually started before the book. I started uh, having them interview Holocaust survivors because as we know, they're, they're old, you know, they're in their 90s. And so I have the students interview the Holocaust survivors and then write a story about them. Um, and the, the kids who are Jewish know quite a bit, but the ones who aren't know nothing, you know, and it's kind of shocking. I mean, they know less than I did, you know, when I was a kid. So I think this is a great group of kids. They're here right now, but most kids don't 
know what happened and no one's teaching it and it's so important you know so i think this book is a way to get it out into the world so that you know we've got that maryland hook we've got that superman hook it's going to get you in there but once you get in there it's going to we call it the trojan horse you know and um so it gets a little dark in yeah, there in the middle it does. but and and i agree i had that same thought that um just when you hear a really tough story or anecdote um and and the chapters are two three pages it switches and it um, talks about some lighter aspects. So, um, you know, you're able to get the hard aspects of the book, but not feel like it's really, really, you know, that dark. I mean, it really has everything. Yeah. Um, and, you know, some of the scenes are incredible. I mean, you know, Jules comes to the States to try to figure out how to get his family here, whether he can open up a, a, a fur business like he had uh, in Europe. And, um, you know, get the sponsorship and all the things he needs. Then he, he goes to get back into Germany, and it's at a point where things are really getting difficult. Um, and, you know, he's at risk of not getting, be able to get back in the country to help to bring his family. And he pretends to be Clark Gable's agent. Right. <laughs> and the Nazi guards consult with each other, and they're, like, impressed by this. And he passes through with that. And the other... Um, Wait, can I just say something? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah. He tells them that Hitler loves Clark Gable. <laughs> and if he doesn't get into, back into Berlin, they won't get Clark Gable's next film. So it's between them and the Fuhrer. Yeah, he's going to be mad. And they so. were scared, so they let him in. They didn't want to upset the Fuhrer. So where he got Clark Gable, I have no well, I think idea. Clark Gable was big. I mean, he was. He was, he was the know, big actor. Huge, so I guess so. today it would be who? Yeah, I don't like know. Don George Clooney? I don't yeah. know. Who's <laughs> He just picked a name out of a hat. You know, but the, the, the presence of mind and the yeah. confidence and, you know, I mean, especially, I mean, there's no bigger pressure moment than that. It's extraordinary what people were able to do. And, and they, the guards apparently said to him, what are you doing trying to come back into Germany? We don't want you here. Go away. Like, it just doesn't make sense to try to go back to Germany when you're Jewish in 1938. But right. he did. So I, I, I categorize that as some of the sort of long shot escape moments that happen in this book. The other one is, is the story of uh, his, his nephew, your great uncle, Don, Don um, where he, he pretends to be drunk in a train in order to avoid um, people checking papers. And then when he gets off of there, they check his papers and they put him in like a block house, which is like a little prison area. And he gets help from a local German who's walking by to let him out. He grabs a freight train for yeah. cover and then um, makes it to the boat he was trying to get to and the folks had held the boat for him. These, these are crazy mo yeah. When did you hear about this and what did it make you think about Don? And well, I always, I mean, I knew Don and I loved him, but I never had any idea about this. And this, this is what I mean about talking to your relatives. Um, I only learned this through his Shoa tape. So he never told me the story. I never got to hear the story directly from him, despite spending every Thanksgiving together. Um, so we watched his Shoah tape, and he, you know, it's a few hours long, and he goes through it very detailed. It was, yeah, it was watched, incredible. And we watched it again and again. I mean, we, we probably could, watched it like We got to keep times. watching it and really pick up the nuances of his story. It was really magical, and we, we just felt so fortunate that he'd made the tape. And Helene, in writing this, I felt like when I was reading that story, I was like, is this the comic or is this the reality, right? right. Like, I don't know if you like, and, you know, created that sense like it was going back and forth. Well, when you write a book like this, you know, narrative nonfiction, you, you want it to come alive, right? So you're going to get as many details as you can. So the basic story is going to come from him, right, from the show of tape. But then you can go and do research into all those places where he was and get details. You get pictures. You see what things look like. Um, you know, you try to fill in the blanks, kind of, and that sort of makes it come alive. Yeah, yeah. and it really came alive. So. It's incredible. Um, and I, as I said to you when we spoke before, um, some of these long shots, um, you know, the fact that they escaped in these kinds of ways and, and helped get their families out, and then for Jules to, after all of those odds that he beat, be able to happen to be in the right place at the right time to get Marilyn Monroe on tape <laughs> at one of the most <laughs> defining, iconic, cultural moments of the 20th century. I mean, the odds are crazy. Yeah. 
yeah, just to get there to that corner, you know, from Germany. For him. <laughs> right, it was not Never walking mind, from uptown like, to downtown. Right, right exactly. No, it, was it was a, a long, long walk. journey. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, he can, kind of lived a bit of a charmed life, I think, you know, and he is the main character, and he sort of brings you through, you know. Yeah. And it's really, he's the hero, uncaped. <laughs> so, t- so let's talk about heroes for a second. I want to talk about Superman and, like, real-life Superman. So... There's Harry Donenfeld. What a character this guy is, right? Like, super complicated guy. Moving alcohol for mob boss Frank Costello. Running pulp magazines. Extramarital affairs. (laughs) Working with Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster on Superman, but, like, kind of cheating them, you know? Completely cheating. (laughs) So this guy is really complicated, and yet um, when Jules' cousin Faye um, goes and tries to convince him to, you know, sponsor Jules, first of all, she she knows who she's dealing with. She gets, you know, dressed up nicely, right? (laughs) (laughs) I mean, the whole thing is incredible. And so so talk a bit about um, heroes, right? Because Superman at least as depicted initially, is an all-American, pure do-gooder. But that's not really who heroes often tend to be. Right. Harry is a complicated hero, for sure. And Jewel, my grandfather, is... I mean, he was my hero my whole... I mean, I, he left Germany when he was 25 years old with a wife and a baby. So he left all his family behind, went to a country where he didn't speak the language to start a new business and start a new life, even though they were saying, don't go, it'll be fine here, don't go. And when I was 25, I thought, would I, would I be able to do that? And I wouldn't. There's no way I would be able to move to another country like that. So he's been my hero my whole life. And, you know, some heroes wear capes and some heroes don't. And Harry Donenfeld definitely did not wear a cape. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He's definitely like a Schindler character, you know. Yeah. He was a bit of a shyster and, you yeah. know. That's but what I appreciate stuff. about it, and this you know, certainly comes from um, the Jewish tradition of the characters in the Bible, um, they're very complicated people, right. right? And the idea is that you don't have to start out as a saint in order to do something good. Like, a good thing can come out of anyone at any time, regardless of who you are, that anyone can be heroic. And so you really learn that in this, in right. this book. Yeah, Harry... Harry definitely did, and his whole family, his children and his grandchildren, are very grateful for our discovery because most people consider Harry Donenfeld kind of a bad guy because he was a bootlegger and he was a pulp publisher and all these things. But he did this great thing, and maybe he did it for more people. We just don't know. Yeah, I mean, Bonnie wouldn't be here if it wasn't for right. Harry. There are 22 know? people in my family who wouldn't be here today if it weren't for Harry Donenfeld. As I said to you, he reminds me of Schindler. Absolutely. And we're hoping to find more people that he did sign for, because he did give money to a lot of Jewish organizations. He was very aware of the Jewish community. That was his good side. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The bad side was something else. (laughs) It's out there in the world, so (laughs) we're waiting for people to come around. (laughs) Well, we are grateful for him tonight, for sure. Um, Talk a bit about the use of movies and comics to influence thinking on social issues. Um, what, you've, what you sort of discovered through this book that was done um, at that point in history that um, you know, this came out. I mean, you know, w- one example I'll share is you know, Billy Wilder, who appears in uh, your book as the, the movie producer. It, his movie Five Graves of Cairo um, might have influenced the British to use an actor double for General Montgomery to confuse German intelligence. That, that movie might have influenced that, that potential move. That's crazy to think That's about. That's crazy, I know. Yeah. And we kept stumbling upon things like this. I didn't know anything about that, you know, but um, I actually wrote that chapter um, <laughs> after being up in the middle of the night and thinking the Holocaust part of the book, which is right smack in the middle of the book, was very, very heavy, like we said. And I was like, I'm afraid people are going to put it down at some point and not going to pick it back up. And I said, we need a Billy Wilder chapter right here, right, right in the middle of it. And that's the Five Graves to Cairo chapter yeah. was it. You know, because I had seen it a, like a few months before, I think. And it just kind of hit me. I was like, that's what we need right here. You know, and so then I took a deep dive into Five Graves 
to Cairo, you know, mm -hmm. um, and that became sort of a, it broke up that middle section. Yeah. You know? And there were other social messages that Superman took on. Oh, tons. Superman in, at that time was, was a real hero fighting for the little guy, fighting against, I mean, really every liberal issue Superman took on. And then he took on Hitler and Mussolini, too. Um, yeah, so before most people were fighting against Hitler in America, mm -hmm. you know, right. it was, they weren't really addressing it yet, but Superman was right in there. Yeah. <laughs> and then to, to think about the fact that there were Jewish writers and authors um, that were sending these messages. Yes, that was very much, I mean, Harry and, and Jack, who owned DC with Harry, were very much behind that also. They were socialists mm -hmm. and they believed in all of that. Um, but the whole comic book industry was Jews because... Mm -hmm. They were illustrators and writers who couldn't get hired by any other magazine. So they moved to the comics industry, and the same thing happened in, in California with Hollywood. They couldn't get jobs writing in more traditional areas, so they started working in movies. You know, the other thing that was really eye-opening to see, um, we talk about um, what immigration was like in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and some of the laws that were enacted to keep certain uh, ethnicities out of the country. But to watch the characters in this book, I mean, really your family, s struggle to um, leave what is certain death and, and danger um, and try to jump through all the hoops, including um, you know, the difficult public charge uh, requirement that you find someone who can sponsor you and not somebody who, you know, just makes, you know, a modest income, but really has tremendous. And, and the idea that, that the amount of income that person has to make is not so defined, that it's really up to the immigration authorities to determine whether you qual like there's so much latitude in there for people to become restricted if they it chose. Um, and, and, you know, these are the people that made it. Um, there were plenty of people who did not qualify and were kept out. Um, so talk a bit about the immigration thing in here and what you realized and discovered through that. Well, the, the other big thing about that is before you even get to the, the sponsor in America, they needed to get like 20 different pieces of paper from different places around the city. And of course, nobody wanted to help the Jews trying to collect their paperwork. They had to go to the police station and get a record showing they were never arrested. They had to go to the doctor and get a record. But every single person they came to talk to was a German. And, <laughs> and Hitler was in power. And so the whole thing was next to impossible. That anyone got out is a miracle. Yeah, they wanted the Jews to leave, but made it almost impossible for them to right. leave. So. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. Um, yeah, and, and we're not the, I mean, Jews aren't the only people who've been excluded. There was a, literally a law called the Chinese Exclusion Act to right. keep people from China out, period. That was it. They were just completely racist. Yeah, the Immigration Act of 1924, you know, kept a lot of Jews and Italians out. That's right. Everybody hated right. the Italians. Right. They were considered Northern criminals. Europe was okay, but other places yeah. not okay. Yep, <laughs> so. right. Um, this picture of Jules and Edith on Lake Vancey uh, is... I mean, you know, the Vansi conference being where the, you know, Nazis discussed and hatched the final solution. Right. Um, that is the only association I've ever had with that place. To see them boating there, I mean, can you talk a bit about that? Well, you know, uh, the, the research really started with the photographs that Bonnie's family had. So really the first week, I think we started work, not even like we we're just doing the proposal for the book. She invited me over to her place in, in um, Connecticut and she had all these photos and we just went through them all. And so, you know, you would find these photos of her grandfather and uh, of course they would write on the back, you know, exactly where they were. And so it said Vonsey Lake, you know, and it, I didn't even know what that meant. You know, I had heard of the Vonsey Conference, I, but I didn't really make the connection, you know. And then we found out that Billy Wilder, who by the way, directed The Seven Year Itch, that's why he's a character, but he also escaped from Nazi Germany <laughs> around the same time that Jules did. Um, uh, he, one of his first big films was about people going out on Sunday. Okay, it was called People on Sunday. And they basically show people going to Wansi Lake in the movie. <laughs> so like, it's just sort of like a jigsaw puzzle, you know, when you're writing a book like this, all these pieces kind of come together. Go ahead. So, no, the, the place, it's this really nice house that was owned by a Jewish doctor. They 
got rid of the Jewish doctor and the Nazis took over this big, beautiful house. It's a villa. Yeah. It's a villa right on the lake with amazing trees and, and these 15, I think, 15 yeah, or 16 like Nazis got together and decided, okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to kill every Jew in Europe. Okay, we're all agreed. Okay, bye. Like, it was a two-hour conference where they made that decision, that announcement. They had a plan. How many Jews in each country were they going to murder? I mean, it was insane. Insane. And it was on this lake. And that's where Jules used to go to right. swim. And, and, <laughs> and when, when you learn about those events, it really feels like an alternate universe, some other planet. Right. And, and so the way you've put these pictures and events together, you realize that, you know, they're like on Lake Michigan, right? right? Like yeah. us pretending that this is a foreign place is, is, you know, to not understand how at home right. people felt right. in the very places where some of the most, you know, diabolical things happened. Yeah, 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 just to, and we went there, you know, Bonnie insisted we go to Berlin, thank God she did, I mean, we, we found incredible stuff. I was able to fill in all those blanks I was talking about, right? Um, going to all the apartments he lived in, um, his businesses, uh, all her, where her relatives lived. Um, and we went to Vonsi Lake while we were there and we went to the, to the house, yeah. you know, the, the conference house. Wow. And it's just, it's chilling, yeah. Because when you're in Berlin, um, you just get this dark feeling, you know, I did, I wish she did too. I mean, um, but that these people were living in this place where it was, all going wrong, you know. I don't know if you guys have been to Berlin, anybody, but it's, uh, it's, there's still, you know, so many new buildings. The, there are old buildings, but so much was destroyed by the bombing. But all of my grandfather's apartments were still there, just completely <laughs> randomly. We had no idea. Yeah. Every single one was there. And we, you know, I'm a reporter, you know, and uh, Bonnie's new to this game, you know, so we would, <laughs> we would go to each of the places and she's like, oh my God, it's still here, it's still standing. Okay, just wait here, just <laughs> be quiet. And then when someone would come along to go into the house, we'd be like, hello, you know, we we're Americans, we're running a bush, you know. <laughs> Can we come in with you? And they're like, oh, sure, you know, <laughs> let us in. And we went in the whole building and took notes. And, you know, it was, it was a great experience. So. Um, and then there's the people who were left behind, um, Edith's parents. Um, and um, that, you know, um, your family um, died in Mali Trostanac, yes. um, where thousands of Jews were taken near Minsk, Russia, and shot. Um, and Evie Rosenthal lost... Uh, family there too. Um, not, not shot though, actually. This is what was really unique about Molly Trostanek is the soldiers were really tired from shooting so many people. They were just really tired. So they came up with a new way to murder people, which was gassing the vans. So they brought people like they were bringing them to a camp, but instead they would gas the vans and then put them in a ditch. And that was the precursor to the, to the um, gassing in the camps. You know, that was the first thing before that, it was sort of a pre, you know, whatever you want to call it. Right. But um, yeah, we, I didn't even know about the gas vans. Did you know about that, mm -hmm. Bonnie, before we started researching the No, not the, I didn't know not anything the, about the it. vans. It was, yeah. somebody had a really good idea. Yeah, it's completely If I insane. take the hose. Yeah, redirect it into the van. And so they would just drive around until the people in the van died. And um, then they would just unload the bodies and right. roll them into a pit, you know, and that's how her great, that's how her great grandparents died. And did you so. find that through the book process or did you know that? No, no, nobody in my family had any idea mm -hmm. what ever happened to them. It was just a complete mystery. They were, my, my great grandfather was accused of stealing bread. Um, he had gone out to get bread one morning and they accused him of stealing it and arrested him. And then my great grandmother said, well, I have to go down and see if he's okay. And she went to the police station and never came back. But then we were able through Nazi records to find out where they took them, where they held them, what train they went on, and where they died. We even found out who else was on the train with them. You know, we had a long list of the people who were on that same train. Um, it, it, it's, the, the crazy thing about the Nazis, of course, is that they kept, kept these detailed records. You know, they were murderers. But they thought they were going to win. So I guess to them, it wasn't a big deal to keep the records, right? But completely incriminated themselves, and it's all right there in black and white. And whatever you want to find out, it's, it's out there in the world. So it's kind of amazing in a way that it's still there. Yeah. So this is not just history. There's current events going on. Um, you know, um, we talked about um, the Dave Chappelle sketch 
where he said, you know, there's a lot of Jews in Hollywood as a part of that sketch. And there's a lot of Jews in your book who are from Hollywood, right? Movie producers and comic book writers. And, you know, there's two ways to say that. There's a lot of Jews in Hollywood. There's a sense of pride and creativity and contribution to culture. And then there's a lot of Jews in Hollywood, this sense that somehow that's a nefarious thing. Um, and anti-Semitism is on the rise today. There is no doubt about it. And so what do you hope this book contributes to current awareness and conversation about those issues? Well, the importance of telling these stories over and over again can't be overstated. But really most, young, I mean, it really is, most Americans probably know Anne Frank and Oscar Schindler. And that's it, that's where their knowledge ends. So I just wanted to introduce new people and new stories so they understand every single story is a miracle. Every survivor has a miraculous story. And, and I just, I wanted more people to understand what happened, who these people were, see them as human beings. Because six million people is a hard thing to comprehend, but one cool guy is easier to comprehend. So it was really about you know, letting him be a stand-in for, you know, as a hero for what he did and how he saved his family. Yeah. yeah. Like I said, um, we want to get into the hands of people who you want to convince not to be anti-Semitic, you know? I don't know if that's gonna work, but that's our, our goal, you know? Um, one of my friends who lives down south posted something about the book the other day, and someone she knows from Mississippi wrote, well, I don't really believe that this happened. <laughs> I was just like, oh my God. This is the first time I came face to face, well, not really face, to Facebook to Facebook, uh, with someone who, didn't, who was a Holocaust denier. And I mean, you hear about those people, but to actually see somebody in action, you know, was really shocking to me. And I was ready to jump in and, and say something to her, but then my friend came in and said, no, 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 it's, it happened, you know. So those are the people wow. that I want to read the book. Yeah, it's shocking to see that yeah. pop up. That it's people insane, really, yeah. insane. Right. The title, The American Way. <laughs> um, well, there's two reasons, really. The American Way is part of Superman's tagline, Truth, Justice, and the American Way. And also, all the things that happened in the book, both good and bad, are very American, like letting my family come to America. That's the American way. We, you know, we're a country of immigrants. Keeping people out of America is also the American way. <laughs> We've done a lot of that, and a lot of people have died. And that applies to a lot of things in the book. Marilyn becoming so incredibly famous after she was an orphaned kid. Um, becoming this huge start, that's the American way. But also her overdosing and you know, tragically dying is the, I mean, all of these things fit and they're really contradictory things sometimes too. So it felt like a good title for that. Yeah, Harry, you know, stealing the money from, well, stealing the comics from <laughs> <laughs> Jerry and Joe is the American way, you know, but also them having it published is the American right. way. Exactly. So. So in 2017, you wrote an article that went viral. Um, that was really the first uh, draft of this book, in a sense. Right. Um, and um, you saw the video of Marilyn Monroe for the first time when you guys met. What was it like? I mean, the video is, is on the Times website still. I, I yeah. watched it today. It is mind-blowing. What was your experience seeing that? It's it just the article is called The Lost Footage of Marilyn Monroe, if you want to look at the It's from 2017. So if you go to the New York Times site, you can find it. You put in our names, it'll pop up. But um, yeah, I, had, I didn't even know Bonnie yet, really. We had spoken on the phone. Trump had just been elected. And... Um, we actually couldn't do the story right away. I couldn't do the story right away because all the news was about Trump. You couldn't even write a story about something else. It was impossible. So we waited a few weeks, I think. We finally got together. Uh, we had lunch, and she showed me the video of Marilyn on her phone. And at this point, I wasn't even sure I was going to do the story. You know, this was just, uh, I was going to pitch it. And I saw the footage. I was, and I was pitching like, it to you. <laughs> she was pitching me, and I was going to pitch the Times. And I saw the footage. I was like, oh my God. And um, it's just beautiful fit. You, you can see it. You look it up online. But, but the great thing about her story wasn't just the Maryland footage. It was Jules, you know, when she told me about him and the crazy Clark Gable story and, you know, the things that he did once he was in America. Uh, he was the reason to write the story, you know. And so, again, Marilyn is the hook to get people in, right? But 
the great part of the story is Jules, you know, and, and that's what that story was about. And then Harry was the big addition that really made the book work. He didn't come till after. We didn't, you know, when we sat down, when I sat down to write the time story and I was interviewing her, she said, you know, there's this other story in my family that the guy who published Superman <laughs> saved my family, but I don't really know his name and I don't know anything about it. And I was like, you know what, just forget it because I have too much I have to deal with right now. I'm dealing with the Nazi escape in Maryland. It's too much for a story. It's not going to fit, right? So we just kind of put it on the back burner and never even thought we were going to write a book. But um, and then when we started to research the book, she had already found some stuff about Harry. And so that was the, the clinching moment. And you know, one of the weirdest moment. things was in the, the list of coincidences that Harry Donenfeld's son, I live in Westport, Connecticut, and when Harry Donenfeld's son left DC Comics, he moved his family to Westport, Connecticut. So his kids went to the same high school my kids were going to. It was just great, out of all the, you know, out of all the gin, gin joints. <laughs> So um, I have one more question for you, but I'm wondering if there's anything you feel like you wanted to say that we haven't covered before I ask you one last question. I, th I think you pretty much covered it. You did a pretty good job, actually. <laughs> I'm happy to I'm go impressed. on the road with you. Where are we going next? <laughs> yeah, let's take it on the road. <laughs> so your relationship is fantastic, right? Like It's like you like, are either sisters or you've known each other forever. Can you talk about when you met and what happened and going to Berlin and... We're totally mishpucha now. <laughs> She's Jewish. She's I, in my, she is part of my family. I have family. great grandparents who are Jewish, so I'm convinced we're related because wow. my family's from Poland and her family was originally from Poland, so I'm sure we're cousins. You know, if we dig, I have to go to Poland and do my research next. That's but the next it, book. But it really, it really, it was just easy. It, I don't know if you guys have had partners that you work with, but when it's just easy, there's literally no issues. There's no, it just, we just talked like a hundred times a day, <laughs> constantly, <laughs> like without saying hello, you know, right. just, so what happened next? <laughs> right. uh, or so no, you find something and you're like, you just start talking about it. Exactly. You know? So it was been really, really awesome. It was Excellent. a great way to spend a pandemic. Yeah, the whole bit. <laughs> <laughs> we came up, well, I guess she came up with the idea to do a book in December before the pandemic. And so we started doing the research for the proposal for the book then, December. And then, you know, two years of just, that's what we did. Wow. Well, thank you for writing it. It was really in, uh, engaging to read. I mean, you f it felt like it was so fast-paced. Um, and um, will you stick around to sign some books? Oh, yeah. yeah. absolutely. Okay, all right. So we have books for sale, and they will be here to sign and answer your questions. Um, I want to thank our partners for hosting, and thank you so much for coming to this book talk. Thank you. Perfect. Oh, yeah, does anybody have any questions they want to follow up with? Helene. Um, I, uh, yes, she asked how I knew to contact Helene with my story. So I've written two other books. I had a book agent who happened to be the same book agent that Helene had. So I called her and I said, do you know someone who could write an article for the Times? Because actually the only reason I took this whole thing on was because of, wait, I just heard a really good name for him, the dictator tot. Sorry, if you don't want to say Trump, there are a lot of good names to say instead. So the dictator tot, I thought was really good. Anyway, because he was elected, I just had to do something. I was freaking out and I didn't know what I could do, but it felt like Germany in 1933 and it felt like it was coming. The hate was just so intense. So I was like, I'm gonna tell my grandfather's story. That's what I'm gonna do. Um, so I asked her if she could recommend a writer and I didn't know I would find one of my best friends. It was like perfect. It was the best fix up. It's true. <laughs> Wait till you read the book. <laughs>